All right, so we have walked through this whole process of identifying explicit themes that are stated and the process of identifying implicit themes that are not stated, but there's clues by uniting the ideas in the text, and they all point to the theme. And once you can identify the thread that ties all these things together, you will fall on the theme, like in Acts or like in Matthew or like in Philippians. It, the details will point you to the theme. And, and they'll do it every time, every time. But there are some things in Scripture that help you identify the theme far easier. They point you directly to it. And so if you notice these things and they're there, uh, sometimes they're not there, but if they're there and you notice them, they're always thematic. They drive you right to the theme. So I'm going to show you some of those, and I can tell you that this is exceedingly helpful. So this makes things way easy if you know this. All right? So here's, here's the, uh, how I phrased it. These are general thoughts on identifying themes. So this is just a bunch of random thoughts on helping to find themes. The first one, and probably what I think is the most important, although a couple of the others are also important, Whenever the introduction says more than the standard greeting, the added comments relate directly to the theme. This is so important, I cannot overstress the importance of it. So, first of all, every book of the Bible is a, in the New Testament now, there's a let, it's a letter, and Paul followed the form, or the New Testament writers, followed the form of writing letters. So if we were writing letters today, we would start, Dear John, how are you? That type of a thing, right? Because that's how we write letters in, in America in the year 2000 and whatever. <clears throat> in the first century, they had a standard way of introducing letters. And it always started with the author naming himself, addressing the audience, and then stating a blessing. Every letter did that back then. It was the standard greeting in every letter, whether it was biblical or secular. And when the Bible takes that standard greeting and expands it, says something more than just Paul to the Philippians, grace and peace to you. When he says more, it's always thematic. And if you pay attention to that, it will point you right to the theme of the letter every time. Okay, so this is a standard greeting. 1 Thessalonians 1 is the standard greeting. Look how sparse this is. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. That is the standard greeting. Author, audience, blessing. Right? Nothing there. Just that. It doesn't give you any details. It gives you, this is the way a letter was written, and they, they, they used it to the Thessalonian church. Many Bibles say more. Uh, many, excuse me, many books of the Bible say more than this. Sometimes they say more about the author. Sometimes they say more about the audience. And sometimes they say more in the blessing. Every time, the author is pointing you to the theme in those opening comments. And if you notice those, it's a jump forward towards the theme. Now, sometimes, sometimes that introductory comment is the theme. That is the theme. And the whole book is developed around the introductory comment in the introduction. I cannot stress how important that is for you to notice. So we're going to walk you through some of this, right? So I'm going to show you a couple uh, introductions to the book that expand these parts, and I'm going to try to show you what, how it's important. So let's start here with uh, Galatians 1, and this is verses 1 through 5. Now I want you to notice how expanded Galatians is. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Now notice he expanded the author, 
big time. But watch this. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory for and ever and ever. Amen. And there you have the five verses of the introduction. Notice when Paul wrote the five verses of the introduction, he began adding information about himself. All right, so let's go back there and I'll show you this and I'll show you why it's thematic. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Now, you know what the problem was in the Galatian churches? We already looked at it. Uh, the problem was that someone came into Galatia behind Paul and distorted the gospel of Christ. And Paul said, if anybody comes preaching a different message, let him be accursed. Remember when we read that? And so what he's saying is, in his opening passage, I'm an apostle. I'm not from men. I didn't come from the high priest in Jerusalem. I'm not through a man. I didn't go to seminary to get this degree. But I'm through Jesus Christ and God the Father. That's why I'm an apostle. My authority is above man's, and it's way up there. So if someone comes preaching a different message than the one I preach to you, it's wrong. That's going to point us to the theme. Now, it's also important, and you would know this if you knew Galatians and studied it a little bit, that one of their arguments was that Jesus Christ did not get along real well with God the Father. And that the message of Jesus is opposed to the message of God the Father. The message of God the Father is the Mosaic Covenant. And Jesus changed the Mosaic Covenant. And there's something not right about Jesus. So when Paul says, I'm a messenger of Jesus Christ, he also adds the statement, and God the Father. I didn't come just from Jesus in opposition to the Father, I came appointed from Jesus and the Father. Now, that's going to fit into the theology of the book. And he introduces himself that way, and in such a way that if you, were, if you know what's coming up, that makes perfect sense. But if you're reading it for the first time, that becomes important to say, oh, there's an issue about who sent Paul. And, and what Paul's message is and where it came from. And that's the book of Galatians. All right, so then notice it, it, the end says, who raised him from the dead? It's, it's, it's not only that God, the, that God and Jesus are working together, but God raised him from the dead. Why would God raise Jesus from the dead if God didn't like Jesus? You know, the proof of the resurrection of Jesus is that God accepted his work. And, and if God didn't accept his work, Jesus would still be in the grave. So you can't tell me Jesus and the Father are working contrary to each other. The Father raised him from the dead. It's the gospel, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the Father is promoting the gospel. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. That's a huge point. And then it's to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There you have it combined again twice in these first opening verses. It's the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ working together. A key element in the argument of Galatians. Now watch this argument of Jesus who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. Now watch, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory. And Paul tacks on the end, it was God's will that Jesus was doing this. And he attaches that here too. But he makes an important statement, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. You know what the argument was of many of those legalizers? Okay, it's okay if you believe in Jesus. That's, that's okay but if you don't believe in Moses, you can never be delivered from sin. 
because God gave the law to keep you from sinning. And, and, if, and if you don't straighten up and fly by the law of Moses, all you have is Jesus, and sin wins. That, that was essentially their argument. And he, Paul, in his introduction, says, no, wait a minute. It's not the law that gives you victory over sin. It's Jesus. Jesus gave himself for your sins. How do you get forgiven? Through circumcision? Through going to church on Sabbath? Through changing your diet and not eating pork? How do, you, how do you get forgiven? But not only how do you get forgiven, to deliver us from the present evil age. What's God's answer to the spiritual victory we're looking for in life? Is it the law of Moses? Does God tell you as a Christian... You believe in Jesus, you become a Christian, and now you follow the law of Moses to live righteously. Is that the message? Most certainly not. That is not New Testament Christianity, and we cannot believe it. In fact, to deliver us from the present evil age, God gave us Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ takes away our sin, and he's the one who drives us to righteous living. If you want that argument spelled out in detail, read Romans 6 and 7. That's his whole purpose in Romans 6 and 7, is to argue that truth in detail. Maybe it's not his whole purpose, certainly one of his purposes. Now, when you come to the book of Galatians, the test was the test of, of the gospel. And it was the gospel versus the message others were preaching, who were legalizers, saying, no, you need the law of Moses. And so in the introduction to the book, he actually introduces that whole theme, and if you're paying attention to the introduction, you're going, oh, this is an issue about who actually gives me victory over sin, takes it away and gives me victory over it. This is an argument of, are, are, are God and Jesus working together, or is there an opposition between them? If I follow Jesus... Is God the Father pleased? Well, of course he is. Uh, you remember the, the guys that came to Jesus and said, what do we have to do to do the will of our Father? And Jesus said, believe on him whom he has sent. The Father's will is to believe in Jesus. They're working together. It all comes out in this introduction. Now, I'm not going to develop the theme here because I'm going to come back to Galatians in another point coming up. So I'm going to leave that here, and we're going to come back to it. So don't lose it in your minds, please. So that's Galatians. Now I want you to see 1 Corinthians, and I want you to watch what he develops here. So that was author audience. Uh, I mean, author blessing. Now watch in 1 Corinthians 1, he's going to not talk about the author and the blessing. He's going to develop the audience. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that's in Corinth. Now he develops the audience here. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, and then, here's the blessing, and there's nothing added to it. It's just grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no development. It's just, there's nothing in the author, there's nothing in the blessing. The development here is in the audience. So I've given you two introductions, one that develops the author and the blessing, and now I'm giving you another one that doesn't develop them. It develops the middle one. What I'm suggesting to you is that the development or the expansion in the audience here is part of the theme, or at least points you to the theme of the book of 1 Corinthians. So let's go back and look at what is actually said about the church of God that's in Corinth. And it says, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, now, if you know anything about the Corinthian church, they were Christian misfits. The Corinthian church was messed up. They had a guy sleeping with his stepmom. Presumably, we don't know the details, his father married a younger woman, and his father died, 
And so he married his stepmom. And Paul said, even pagans don't do this. The Corinthian church, you think, would have been astonished, right? You think the Corinthian church would have gone, oh, that's not good. They took pride in the fact that they were allowing the grace of God to be displayed in this way, that among us could be this guy that could marry his mother, his stepmom. And you're going, that's sick. That's sick. And Paul writes, that's sick. Okay. In the Corinthian church, they were taking each other to court. So one Christian was suing another Christian over things that should have been settled internally. And they were going to pagans. And, and they were, they were uh, uh, having pagans pass judgment on Christian behavior. And that's a crazy, that's the passage that says, don't take another Christian to court. Let Christians decide Christian issues because we have the judgment of God. That's Corinthians. Uh, another passage in Corinthians is, is the way they were doing communion. You remember that what they did in communion was that they had uh, uh, wealthy people who were slave owners. And those wealthy people would tell their slaves to finish up their duties and then come to church. So the slaves would be over there doing their duties and then these wealthy people would come and they'd eat and drink and they'd be full and drunk and then the slaves would come and there'd be nothing left. And Paul said, that's why some of you are dying because you do not recognize the body of Christ. You guys are misfits. That's the Corinthian church. In the introduction, he says, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. A bunch of misfits, and yet God set them aside in Christ Jesus and called them to be saints. Do you know that you probably struggle with sin? And if you don't now, be thankful because you will tomorrow. Um, you probably struggle with that. And sometimes you wonder, is God going to kick me out? Is God done with me? I, I have a trouble with sin and, and I'm a Christian misfit. I mean, uh, my mind is bad. My impulses are bad. I can't get victory in this area. Whatever, you're probably struggling with all that kind of stuff because you're teenagers. I've been there. Listen to this. These are Christian misfits. Sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints. And you might be struggling with an issue of sin and God looks at you and says, yeah, but you're mine. You're mine. I've sanctified you in Christ Jesus. I've set you apart for me and I've called you into fellowship with me. I've called you as a partner in the gospel. Do you know that word saint there is the same word in Philippians, if my understanding is correct, as partner. It's the same word. You're called to be a partner with God in Christ. Whether you struggle with sin or not, that's your calling. Now look what happens. Together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Now you want to know something? What happens in the body of Christ? What happens in the body of Christ is that when you get saved, you're united together into one body. And it's not just you and your local church and you and your, your classmates. It's you with the, with the church in Iran. And it's you with the church in Bolivia. And it's you with the church in Omaha. You're united together with, with, with who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When God saves your soul, He brings you into the body of Christ and He unites you together as one. Not only with each other, but with me who you've never met. And with Christians who are suffering in Iran, in Iraq. And you're one with them. You know what the problem in Corinth, Corinth is? They can't get along with anybody. They hate the poor people. The wealthy are making their slaves show up late. They don't give two hoots about them. They take each other to court. They're, 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 they don't care about morality. They're prideful that they would allow someone like that in their midst. And they're destroying their relationships. You want to know the theme of First Corinthians? It's verse 10. I think I have it here. 
No, I don't. I'm going to look it up. 1 Corinthians 1.10 is the theme. Now watch how this introduction points to this theme. So 1.10 says this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. And the book develops that concept all the way through. Let's agree together in the Lord. And if that's the case, I can never take you to court. I can never treat you like a, like a sub-citizen of heaven just because you happen to be poor and I happen to be wealthy. I can never mistreat you if we agree together in the Lord that we're saints, sanctified in Christ Jesus, and we're united together in the body of Christ. And all of a sudden, unity is the predominant theme of the body of Christ. That's Corinthians. Read it. You'll see it blossom. It was presented to us in the introduction, in the way he described the audience. God establishes unity among us, and we have to maintain and promote unity and never division. And believe me, when your local church fights, and many local churches fight, when it fights, it's wrong. I don't care what it's over. I don't care what it's about. Fighting is always wrong in the body of Christ. You have to settle it righteously and allow Scripture to dominate. That's 1 Corinthians. It's that, it's that powerful. Now, here's what I'm showing you. In Galatians, it was the author and blessing that were expanded. In Corinthians, it was the audience. Both of them point directly to the central message of the book. When a book says more in the introduction than the standard greeting, you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention. So now I'm going to take you to this one because I left this out intentionally. Now when you look at the introduction of Philippians, and we now know the theme, partnership in the gospel, we now know it's a thank you letter that is uh, 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 being written because of their gift. The introduction says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. And then he says with the overseers and deacons. And you go, why does he throw that in there? How are the overseers and deacons different than the saints? They're not different than the saints. Well, no, they're not any different than the saints. But when your church decides to support a missionary and they decide how much money to send the missionary, who makes that decision? Isn't it your leaders? Your leaders come, a missionary comes, they say, we need some support. You're bored. Your elders and deacons, they go off and they discuss whether or not God is leading your church to support them. And then they come back to the congregation and say, we think we should support this missionary at 100 bucks a month. And your church then stamps the approval because you're following the leadership of the church. And when Philippi was raising money to send to Paul, don't think that the leaders weren't the initiators and the key people in getting it done. This was a struggling congregation. These were in desperate financial straits. And somebody said, I think we should send a gift. I was at a conference. No, he was a speaker in a church where I was the youth pastor. His name is Norman Geisler. And it was right when the Iron Curtain was coming down in Europe, and he, went, he was invited over to Poland to speak. And he went over to Poland, and he, he uh, preached a conference over there. And he said that they had found a copper coin on, a, on the floor, just a, a, a little a coin. It wasn't not even a quarter. It was worth of value. And they took that quarter, and they set it over here on this little thing part of the stage, and it sat there all week. It never moved. And... and he finally said, come on, what's that doing there? And they looked at him, shocked, and they said, somebody lost that. They need that. Extreme poverty. 
out of that extreme poverty, someone in the leadership team of Philippi said, hey, let's send a gift to Paul. And everybody said, that's a good idea. With the overseers and deacons. It's there. You have to ask why. Because all scripture is inspired by God. And it relates to the theme. It, it's, it's helping us identify the theme. So whenever you find that, it's thematic. Okay, so here's your next point. The, uh, on general thoughts, on identifying themes, repetition is thematic. Every time something is repeated... It's pointing you to the theme. Repetition is thematic. It's different than writing in America today. So in America today, we have typewriters or we have computers or we have photocopiers or we have whatever, and we can just and shoot this stuff out in papers a dime a dozen, and the cost to writing today is minuscule, minuscule. But when they wrote, it was laborious work. So they had to... Uh, uh, roll out plant leaves and then they had to process the plant leaves and then they would have to take a pen and they'd, they'd, they'd write on that and they'd dip the pen in some kind of expensive ink and it was laborious. It was work. So for us where there's no work at all, if we repeat something, your teacher goes, ah, oh, quit being so repetition, repetitious. When they repeated something, it was intentional because it was important to get you to see the argument that he's making or pointing you to the theme. Whenever anything is repeated, you have to make particular note of that. It is always thematic. It's never careless writing. Okay, never. So when there's repetition, it's directing you to the point the author's making. So I want you to notice this. And we're going to walk now through the theme of Galatians. And I'm going to show you some things. And you're going to go, oh, it's so obvious it sticks out like the nose on my face. It's just that clear. So I'm, we now know the book of Galatians is about the gospel. Because some people was, were, were distorting the gospel of Christ. And they shouldn't turn to another gospel because there's only one. And so I'm going to now walk through this passage. And I want you to start counting on your fingers every time the word gospel is used or it's a pronoun for the gospel. So every time you get a, the word gospel or a pronoun, a reference to the gospel, count, click it off, okay? And here's what's going to happen. You're going to need more than two hands, so start using your toes. Just it, 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 watch what happens. Repetition. I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, how many times did the gospel or a reference to the gospel come up in the opening 12 verses of, of, of Galatians. Who is a number? Any number. Come on. Twelve. Okay, twelve. Twelve. In, in, in six verses. Six to t- seven verses. Six to twelve. Seven times Paul repeated the idea of the gospel. Seven times. And that's if you counted right. That's if you counted right. If you go back, it might be 13. I don't even know. I just know it's repeated. And when he repeats like that, it's not careless writing. He's driving you to his point. You need to understand there's one gospel. There's not another gospel. It's the gospel from God. And on, he's hammering it. And you know what happens if you read on and you get to chapter 2? 
Here's what happens in chapter 2, and here's where you can identify precisely the theme of Galatians. So in chapter 2, as part of his discussion there, when he took Titus, who was an uncircumcised Gentile, to Jerusalem, to a council in Jerusalem before Peter, John, James, right? He took him to that council and said, does Titus need to be circumcised? That was the question. Titus is a Gentile believer. He's a teaching of the Word of God, uh, a teacher of the Word of God. Does he need to be circumcised? And then he took him there, and this is part of his argument. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. And the gospel now takes on definition. The gospel has turned into the truth of the gospel. And then he repeats that in verse 14. And he was addressing Peter directly. And he was talking to Peter. Peter messed up and he said, but when I saw that their conduct, that's including the apostle Peter, when Peter was not in step with the truth of the gospel, Paul goes on to say, I confronted him to his face. You know what Peter did? There were people, he came to, to Galatia. Uh, I, 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 I don't know where he came. But people from Jerusalem followed him there. And when they got there, he no longer would eat in, in, in Gentile, with Gentiles. He separated himself with the rest of the Jews. So the Jews came from Jerusalem and they had their own table over here. And they sat here as a bunch of Jews because of the Gentiles. And Peter, who was eating with them before they came, decided, well, I better eat with these guys because these are the Jewish Christians. And Paul went, Peter, what are you doing? The truth of the gospel is that Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit just like we did. That's the whole book of Corinthians. Together in every place with all those who call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Peter, you are wrong. Do you know that every time you divide with another believer, you're not walking in step with the gospel? Every time. I don't care how you fight. The fight's wrong. Isn't that amazing? That's it's awesome. Repetition. So 12 times you get into chapter 2 and he defines it. He, he narrows it down. This gospel message gets narrowed down to what is the truth of the gospel. And I suggest to you that that's the theme of the book of Galatians. So you might phrase it around the truth of the gospel, or you might phrase it around justification by faith alone. Uh, no law added, no works added, but that's kind of the, the, the message of the book. Okay, so now I'm going to take you to repetition in an Old Testament book. I haven't done this yet. Let's see, it's 1.26, we're an hour in. Um, you ready for a 10-minute break? Okay, everybody, you get a 10 or 15-minute break. And we'll come back to this, and I will develop this further. Uh, again, boy, you guys are troopers. Thanks a lot. <laughs>